Okay, let's start with like this only as we are facing some technical difficulties today. Uh, okay, welcome, welcome to One Stop Current Affairs, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hindi News Analysis. Uh, and I hope you're doing really well, exceptionally well today. Uh, let me just mute it because I can hear my own voice. Yes. So, uh, as usual, I'm here with you with the, some of the most important news and uh, which are relevant for your UPSC exams. As we have selected these four news items which are the most important for your UPSC exams. Uh, as we can see here on screen, uh, this is the Sputnik V as the government may give not to the Sputnik V vaccine, uh, vaccine which is from uh, Russia. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, news because as the COVID cases are on the rise across the country, it becomes very important for all of us to understand that uh, Sputnik V may get very uh, not from the government very soon. So this is the most important news of the day. Then we have the Rafal. Uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, Rafale jets which have been flown down from France to India. Now uh, some of uh, eight to nine more Rafale jets are likely to come to India. So uh, these are the things which are going to take place. Uh, let me just I can now right so yes uh, I'm so sorry just facing some technical issues today so uh, then uh, this is an editorial piece on the h1b visa uh, as the Bi president Biden has let it expire uh, the, the decision which was taken by the former president to cancel all the H-1B visas basically uh, now Biden has and Biden has to issue basically former president Donald Trump had cancelled to give a new H-1 visas to the people who are uh, trying to attain it and this is a very important visa for those people of uh, who are seeking employment in the US especially uh, the largest beneficiary of this visa is Indian uh, are the Indians and then we have another editorial piece uh, this is the rare diseases uh, which we will see in detail let's go to our first story today that is the Sputnik V uh, it's the most important and vital story of the day as you know that the COVID cases are on the rise right now and it is becoming very difficult for government of India to, uh, uh, to you know, control it as people are out on streets and it's becoming, a lot of things are becoming uh, 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 not possible for the government to contain right now because a national lockdown is highly unlikely like last year, last time, last year we had, uh, it was during the same time last year which we had. Uh, it's highly unlikely it's not going to take place this time as a lot of experts have been saying now uh, what is this russian vaccine and how important it can uh, lead uh, india's fight against the coronavirus so uh, let's see what we have here so uh, the covid cases are on the rise as i have already told you that uh, it has crossed a one lakh mark in one day this is the first time in this year that it has crossed one lakh mark in one day in India uh, highest number of cases registered in one day in 2021 so this is again becoming a bit of problem for everyone you remember last year these uh, cases were on the rise during September from July to September and then the cases uh, the spikes start going down 
but again it's going up so it's a problem it's a concern for everyone uh, now as already two vaccines are already operational uh, you know that uh, we've just been reading two vaccines are already operational. Those are uh, Covaxin and Covishield. Now, uh, let's let's look at here that Sputnik V may be cleared for emergency use in India. So uh, it's not that, it, it, it's now, right now, it's under trial, it's under phase three trial. So it can be cleared for the emergency use in India. Sputnik V was denied by, uh, denied authorization in India. It was denied authorization in India. You know that Sputnik V has been in controversy because it was under phase two, three, uh, phase two and three uh, of trials in Russia itself when it was uh, authorized, when it was uh, administered. Now it is. Uh, the, it was also India signed a deal with Russia for the Sputnik V. Now uh, the situation has because the COVID cases are on the rise once again, so it is becoming paramount for India to take necessary steps now why uh, authorization uh, was denied to sputnik v this is very important the dcgi and that that means the director controller general of india uh, the, the the top body which gives approval to the vaccines sought more data on vaccine stability they wanted more data on sputnik v's uh, efficacy and everything they wanted to be sure before you know, uh, releasing the data and making it for uh, public use. They wanted to make sure that uh, the vaccine is stable and people who are using this vaccine uh, should not face any kind of a threat or danger while doing this. So uh, that was the whole idea behind uh, doing this. Uh, now, uh, let's see this. Sputnik V has been allowed by 59 countries for usage so far. So it's... This vaccine uh, has been allowed by 59 countries across the planet uh, for usage. Uh, now, Sp Sputnik V, uh, it's 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 been developed. It's it's really it's developed by Gamalaya Research Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology by Microbiology developed by Sputnik V. So basically, it's. Uh, developed by a Russian uh, uh, research institute and uh, it, it can be very important this can be an important question for your uh, prelims uh, where you can be asked uh, which organization developed Sputnik V vaccine so please remember this name uh, Gamalaya Research Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology Sputnik V is a two-dose adenovirus-based vaccine. It's not. It's uh, it's similar to Covaxin and Covishield. Covishield. Uh, this, uh, they are the two-dose uh, vaccines. Both are the two-dose vaccines. And uh, uh, the now, now the challenge is to facilitate its storage. Why? It is very challenging to facilitate its storage. Why? Because the liquid form of vaccine requires to be stored at minus 18 degrees Celsius. So it requires minus 18 degrees Celsius storage facility, which is very important and very vital. Uh, the vaccine would be efficient if it's not stored. It will uh, not remain like it won't be uh, very efficient if it's not stored at minus 18 degrees Celsius, the liquid form of the vaccine and freeze dried version. Can be stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. Free diversion of the vaccine can be stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. Now, uh, the company which is looking for, uh, which is working as the promoter for Sputnik V is the Russian Direct Investment Fund. Uh, they are looking into all these, uh, the promotion and the aspects of the Sputnik V. Uh, the, the Russian Develop Direct Investment Fund signed a contract with three Indian firms for manufacturing 300 million doses. That means 30 crore, 30 crore uh, dosage. So uh, it's basically this vaccine will be manufactured at a very large scale in India 
and 30 crore dosage of this vaccine will be produced in India. Sputnik V is likely to be cleared in the next 7 to 10 days. Uh, Sputnik V has an efficacy of 91%. Now, this is something which is very important because uh, the two vaccines which are, are already operational in India, Covishield, sorry, and Covaxin, both have an efficacy of 81%. So now this is something which is very important to know. Uh, Sputnik V has an efficacy of 91%. So, so far, what, what data which has been provided for Sputnik V, it claims that it has an efficacy of 91%, but it is, uh, uh, it is up to the authorities to see what kind of an efficacy it's providing in India. Now, uh, you can see this. This is something which is very important, COVID shield. These are the two vaccines which are operational in India and Covaxin. This is uh, Covishield developed by uh, AstraZeneca, a Swedish firm. Uh, in, uh, uh, they were in partnership with uh, Oxford University and it is being manufactured by India Serum Institute. So this is something which is very important for all of us to know. Uh, uh, Covaxin, it's developed by Hyderabad based Bharat Biotech and uh, it is uh, uh, an indigenously developed vaccine and a first Indian vaccine indigenously developed vaccine to be operationalized for emergency usage in India. So this is something which is very very important for all of us to know uh, these things. Uh, this is relevant for your prelims examination. now. Uh, let's go and check out some of the details about the COVID shield because it was one of the first vaccines to get operationalized. It is not developed in uh, uh, in India, uh, but first to get operational nod. Uh, Co-developed by the University of Oxford and British Swedish company AstraZeneca in collaboration with Serum Institute of India. COVID shield efficacy is 81.13% if both doses have been administered. Uh, now, it is something which is very important to know. This uh, Serum Institute Chief Executive Adar Punawala has been nominated for Asian of the Year Award along with six other people. So, Adar Punawala, uh, he is a, uh, a young CEO of the Serum Institute, has been nominated for the Asian of the Year Award. Uh, so this is something which is very important and once again it is important according to your prelims examination. Covaxin is the second vaccine and the first indigenously vac uh, developed uh, COVID-19 vaccine with an efficacy of 81%. India's first indigenously developed COVID-19 vaccine. So this is very important for you to know this. Uh, Developed by Bharat Biotech in collaboration with ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research. Please do not forget about this. This is something which is very important. ICMR, you should know, uh, is Indian Council of Medical Research and National Institute of Virology. So, uh, this is a vaccine which is done, which is being developed in collaboration by the three organizations, which is Bharat Biotech. ICMR and National Institute of Virology. Covaxin received approval for Phase 1, Phase 2 human trial from July 2020. It received approval for Phase 1 and Phase 2 human trial from July 2020 last year. Received approval from DCG, DCGI, Director Controller General of India for use in emergency situation in January 2021. So. They received uh, uh, a permission from the uh, DCGI for uh, the emergency use in January 2021. Now we'll come to our second story, which is the Rafal story. Uh, so we have learned now that uh, the another batch of these Rafal jets will reach India in mid-May. So this is something which is very important uh, and eight to nine planes will complete the first quadrant of the fighters. 
eight to nine planes will complete the first quadrant. the fighters. Sorry. Yes. So India to receive eight to nine Rafal in mid May. Uh, this is something which is very important for all of us to know that India uh, is going to receive the next batch of Rafal jets, that is around eight to nine Rafal jets in mid May. Uh, at the, it will not all these Rafal will come together. They will come one by one or two to three aircrafts together, uh, and the delivery will start from April onwards only. Uh, Till mid-May, the delivery of these many aircrafts will be completed. So, this is uh, uh, the Rafal are a very important uh, fourth generation. People say it's a 4.5 generation aircraft, and it is uh, something which uh, was very important for Indian Air Force. They have been uh, wanting this for a very very long time. So. Uh, now let's see what's there also uh, we'll complete first quadrant of fighters in IAF these uh, the aircrafts when these eight to nine aircrafts will arrive they will complete the first quadrant in the Indian Air Force uh, of the Rafale jets and uh, with this I think the long paucity and the demand of the Rafale jets which has been uh, made by uh, Indian Air Force will be completed so the first quadrant of the Rafale jets will be uh, uh, completed uh, with the arrival of these eight to nine uh, aircrafts. First quadrant will have 14 jets. It will have 14 jets. So this is something which is important for your prelims. You should know how many jets will be there. So sorry, I don't know. What's the problem today? Yes prelims so we'll have 14 jets and it is uh, IF is set to operationize the second Rafale squadron at Hasimara in West Bengal it will be operationalized the second squadron will be operationalized from West Bengal's Hasimara this is also important for your prelims normally they ask about the first rarely they can ask but you should be aware about these things. India and France signed 7.87 billion euros Rafale jet deal in September 2016. So the deal was finally signed after years of negotiation in 2016. The, the negotiations they started around uh, uh, negotiations on Rafale started around year 2008. And finally, it will reach to its culmination in 2016. India signed the deal with 13 India-centric enhancements. So the deal, the, the Rafale deal, uh, as it, it has been signed with 13 India-centric enhancements, means a lot of things have been added to these Rafales. Uh, it's, it's not that uh, the company dissolved which made the aircraft uh, give it as it is. Uh, Indian Air Force demanded certain enhancements in the aircraft like there is a radar system which has been uh, included in the aircraft uh, and that radar system is not uh, the French, it is an Israeli radar system. A lot of other features have been included in this like the 13 Indian centric enhancements it talks about like the, uh, it talks about that. Uh, it is uh, the first batch of the first five Rafale jets arrived in July 2020. It was during the Galwan crisis. Uh, there was a lot of buzz during those times. 
So you must have been remembering, remembering that uh, the first batch, the first batch contained three single seat, and this is and I'm so sorry, and two twin seat aircrafts. Uh, first batch had a stopover at Al Dafra, UAE. So this is something because it, it's the first batch. So I give just information for you so you can remember this. Uh, the first batch of the aircraft were it, it had a stopover at Al Dafra. It started flying from France. Uh, accompanied by French Air Force refuelers uh, uh, till UAE uh, and post which uh, in an Air Force refuelers uh, from UAE uh, they brought Rafale to the Ambala Air, Air Base where it was finally inducted in the Air Force. The second squadron will be ready by 2023. Second squadron of Rafale jets will be ready by 2023. So why Rafale is so deadly and why it is considered to be in a deadly aircraft? A lot of people say it because it's a 4th generation aircraft but a lot of experts say it's a 4.5 generation aircraft. Uh, I'm so sorry, once again my pen has stopped working. Yes. Yes, so it's a So four point five generation aircraft, which experts believe uh, can operate from aircraft carrier. It can easily operate from aircraft carrier and shore base. So uh, this is there. It can carry uh, operate from both aircraft carriers. And shore based, uh, India has an aircraft carrier, uh, and shore bases, of course, from the ground uh, aircraft carrier, it's the, the, the uh, uh, a ship which carries aircraft, so that is called aircraft carrier for those students who are uh, a little confused about what aircraft carrier is. Uh, now, the combat range of this aircraft is 780 to 1650 kilometers which is huge because in uh, India's uh, standpoint, if you're looking at, uh, it is very tactical because India has a policy of not, uh, or, or India has never been an aggressor. It has been, uh, uh, it has always maintained that it will not attack anyone first uh, and it will defend its borders. So for India, uh, India look for an aircraft which has a combat range where it can damage uh, uh, you know, level a susceptible, susceptible amount of damage to the enemy's uh, aircrafts or uh, their uh, fighter jets. So this is something which is very important. Uh, now Rafale has a Meteor Bison visual range air-to-air -air missiles powered by run jet engines for a range over 120 to 150 kilometers at max full speed. So this is something which you should know that basically you must have seen in a lot of films that uh, there's a when whenever there is an air-to-air -air combat between aircrafts, so the flights come and they you know uh, target each other with missiles. So this uh, Rafale has come out with this BVRAM, as in, in short form we call it beyond visual range air-to-air -air missiles. So basically, when uh, there's an air to air dogfight or a combat, uh, Rafale has this uh, great advantage because it has this B RAM missile uh, which has a range of uh, 120 to 150 kilometers. So it can foresee its enemy coming and it can also target it from this range. So this is very important. Has a scalp air to ground cruise missiles that can hit targets well over 300 kilometers. So uh, it has this air-to-ground missile scalp, uh, which can target air-to-ground, uh, which can hit targets 
uh, or up to 300 kilometers and you remember the Balakot uh, it was uh, it was the Indian Air Force which used their Mirage 2000 to target the terror launch pad of jesh e Muhammad. so uh, you know Indian Air Force can use these uh, Rafale jets to target these uh, terror terror launch paths uh, along the line of action line of control and uh, they can uh, level huge damage to these terror outfits now indian air force uh, still needs 400 aircrafts there is a lot of paucity of aircrafts india needs a lot of aircrafts to fulfill their demands of the squadrons there's a lot of paucity uh, uh, i have requires them fast to rebuild their 42 squadrons India needs 42 squadrons. That was the demand of Indian Air Force very, very long time. As its fleet is getting old, uh, it needs to replace MiG-21s, MiG-29s and Mirage 2000. It needs to replace all these aircrafts. Currently, IAF has, ha IAF, IAF has uh, 20, 32 squadrons. Indian Air Force has 32 squadrons. This is a matter of grave concern. A lot of things have been uh, are responsible for this uh, paucity of aircrafts. Is it a lacklusterness in the policy making? Uh, uh, and a lot of things have been there. Now we come to the A Walk Back. This is an editorial piece written uh, in the Hindu Today. Uh, it is about the rare diseases and the policy which has been uh, 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 brought in by the government. Now, something which is very important. Uh, sorry, this is. We talk about this walk back. So, this is basically Biden uh, administration's. Uh, Biden shows intent on reworking immigration rules by not extending H 1B visa ban. So, this is uh, basically a walk back from President Trump's proclamation where he uh, stopped all the H-1B visas. So uh, this is President Biden trying to rectify those steps taken by President Trump, the former President Trump. Uh, President Joe Biden allowed a ban on issuance of H-1B visa for skilled workers to lapse in March 2021. So this was his election promise. This was, he said this during his a uh, poll campaign, why H-1B visa is so important and why it was so making so much buzz in India, we'll see uh, ahead. But just remember these things that H-1B visa is specifically important for Indians. Uh, it is uh, a lot of in software developer software, IT professionals from India go to US and seek employment and seek work permit in under this H-1B visa. Uh, Biden fulfilled his campaign promise. He fulfilled his campaign promise. That was his campaign promise that he will allow uh, people to attain H-1B visas. Uh, Biden move is going to have a great impact on Indians. Uh, as 70% of Indians seek visa under this H-1B, uh, Indians were the largest to benefit from H-1B visas. Up to 2,000, 2,9,000. 219,000 visa applications were blocked by Donald Trump. So these many applications were blocked by President Trump and this was something, a matter of great concern. Uh, a lot of things were under stress and especially between India and the US at that point of time. Uh, Indian IT services exported to the US totaled uh, $29 billion in 2019. So a lot of companies like TCS are there in the US and they, uh, they used to import like that. They used to send their IT professionals uh, to the US uh, uh, and uh, uh, like the, they exported around $29 billion. Like basically this was the amount of uh, services which was provided to the US by Indian IT uh, by Indian IT company uh, Indian IT services. Uh, CEOs of the tech giant protested against Donald Trump's move. A lot of like the Google CEOs on the Pichai he protested against this move from President Trump. Uh, uh, they were irked with clampdown on key labor driving their core operations. Basically, 
Indians and these tech, these techies, IT professionals from India were the key labor. They were the core. Uh, they were the key labor who used to handle their core operations. So, a lot of companies' core operations got affected because of it. Uh, a lot of companies hire Indians because they are efficient. Uh, they uh, do a lot of work. They are more uh, capable of doing a uh, uh, good uh, lot of work and they have high thinking, knowledge and everything. Uh, so Biden recognizes that there are limits to Trumpian, Trumpian dogma of economic protectionism. So now it is also important to understand that he also understands, President Biden also understands that what Trump did was not something which was all of a sudden. He did that because there was a course within the US uh, of protectionism as a lot of professionals from across the planet visit US, get jobs, and a lot of native US citizens aren't able to get any jobs there. So this is something which was very problematic and Biden understands it and he realizes it that if <coughs> if uh, uh, he has to uh, sustain his tenure and make a lot of credible uh, impact within the mindset of people and those people who have not supported Trump in the last election, in the 2020 elections, he has to make sure that there is economic growth and a lot of Americans get jobs. So the balance of immigration policies can be maintained. Biden has clearly not forgotten 74 million votes from Mr. Trump. As I told you that his vote share, Mr. Trump's vote share, it increased to 74 million. Uh, it increased and it reached around 74 million. And uh, a lot of people say that Currently, the United States is the most divided country in the world because a lot of support Trump supporters are still, uh, you know, uh, they they they're crazy about him. They uh, they think about him day and night, and they um, uh, they call the last elections forged. Uh, and they have a lot of uh, grievances against the de Democrats, uh, and a lot of things are there. But uh, still, he, uh, Mr. Biden, was democratically elected, and uh, uh, when he came to power, he came with a uh, with uh, with a lot of you know uh, claiming that he will bring sanity back to uh, U.S. policy. Uh, he will step aside from U.S. protectionism. He will uh, take America once again to the mainstream. He will uh, step aside from the protectionism, from the isolation which America has entered during the President Trump's tenure. So all these things were there. Uh, Biden will be unwise to reject the America first ideology. He has no choice, but he has to make sure that uh, the Native Americans uh, also uh, get the benefits of the economic growth and he cannot afford to you know, move away from uh, this America first ideology. Biden pushed to push gradual reforms to nudge US economy. Uh, he understands that he has to push gradual reforms to, you know, bring back US economy, bring, uh, take it to, to its own glory. Uh, those reforms will position US back to multilateral cooperation. It will only uh, push uh, back US to the multilateral cooperation and uh, basically what as I told you earlier that uh, President Trump isolated once again, followed the policy of isolation and he was more US-centric policy, he was designing more US-centric policies. So uh, President Biden will take US to much more multilateral corporations, he believes in much more multilateral corporations, which will enhance uh, the growth of the United States. What Trump did exactly? So, uh, former President Trump issued a presidential proclamation announcing his decision to suspend coveted foreign work visas such as H-1B, H-4 and H-2B visa. It created a lot of uproar. Uh, uh, these, uh, he stopped all these uh, foreign work, uh, coveted foreign work visas and uh, it created a lot of problems for 
the tech engineers, uh, the techies, uh, the MBA professionals who are residing in the United States. H4 visa issued to the immediate family members of the H1B visa holder. This is this also became a problem because a lot of H1B visa holder family members who applied through H4 were not allowed, were not given this visa. Decision was aimed to protect American workers who lost jobs due to COVID-19. It was a decision taken for American workers to put to who lost their jobs in COVID-19. So H1 visa, H1B visa is very popular among Indian IT companies uh, like TCS, Wipro, all, all these uh, Infosys. Uh, issued for a period of three to six years. This visa issued for a period of three to six years given to people in, spe in speciality occupation. Like uh, basically if they are techies yeah, to IT professionals, these visa are, visas are given to them. Total number of H1B visas issued annually is 85,000. So these many visas and uh, H1B visas are issued annually. Indian workers receive about 70% of these work permits. They receive like 70% of Indians receive this work permit. Now we come to the good start. Uh, uh, it is about the rare disease uh, policy which is being brought by the government of India. Uh, it is something for people who are suffering from rare diseases. Uh, this is something which is very vital and important. Uh, because in India now, COVID has as COVID has exposed a lot of um, uh, medical uh, lapses, like la problems in the medical infrastructure in the country. How government can come out uh, and bring out more inclusivity in the society through their schemes? So this is uh, a new scheme which has been brought by government of India. Let's see what it is exactly and what the editorial is about. So first we start with the editorial rare disease, a good start basically. A good start is the name of the, uh, is the uh, header of the editorial piece. So written notification of the national policy for rare diseases 2021 is based on principal exclusion. So this is the national policy for rare diseases. There is a recent re notification which has been released and it is based on principle of inclusion. It's not to, you know, not to leave anyone behind. The entire policy is designed in a way that uh, it not only deals with only uh, big time diseases or big illnesses, uh, it also disease, it also, you know, uh, deals with rare diseases which are very rare in uh, society, which only few limited number of people have. Uh, offers financial support for treatment up to 20 lakhs. It was previously 15 lakhs. Now it was, after a lot of interventions from the courts and NGOs and all these, the policy, uh, the, the, the financial support now offered by the government is up to 20 lakhs. Policy even introduced crowdfunding mechanism previously it wasn't there. Uh, now uh, the, the, the government can actually, uh, you know, they can uh, go ahead for crowdfunding, they can ask people for money uh, for those people who are suffering from serious uh, rare disease ailment and in requirement of a lot of money for treatment. Uh, WHO has said that 6.5 to 10 per thousand for 10,000 people have rare diseases. So this is a huge number. Uh, it might sound it might not sound like that, but this is a huge number. And it's a problem. So imagine 17 million people. 70 million patients with rare diseases are there in India. It means 7 crore people have rare diseases in India. What are those rare diseases? They have a list of those diseases which have been, been given by the government of India. Uh, now the writer argues that the policy felt short of delivering the complete mandate. The, he's, uh, the writer still believes that the policy is still not complete. The national policy for uh, rare diseases is still not complete. It leaves behind, it has several shortfalls uh, and it has not taken everything into consideration. Uh, no funding has been allocated to immediate and lifelong treatment needs. Uh, there has been no funding which is being allocated to uh, 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 immediate, like if a person requires immediate treatment, 
or uh, someone who requires lifelong treatment no funding has been allocated to them which is a problem uh, cost to help already diagnosed patients will cost uh, uh, around 100 to 800 80 to 100 crores so already diagnosed patients were there uh, according to experts this cost is, it will it will go around 80 to 100 crores Government of India benef uh, exchequer has to spend around 80 to 100 crores on the people who has been diagnosed with rare diseases. Centre should try and work out cost sharing agreement with states. States like they have already worked out these cost sharing uh, agreements with uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and Karnataka. They should try and you know, uh, reach Nataka. They should try and reach an agreement with other states as well. Patients with rare diseases will be eligible for one time treatment under Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Yojana. So basically, this is the policy, this is the scheme that someone who is uh, who has a rare disease will be eligible for one time treatment under Pradhan Mantri Ayushman Bharat under Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana this is one of the world's biggest Ayushman Bharat one of the world's biggest uh, health uh, scheme by government uh, it is a lot of people call it Modi care as well uh, uh, and uh, this is one of the shortfalls which we, we have talked previously that this policy only allows you to have one time treatment under this Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. It does not provide you uh, for uh, long term treatment or for immediate treatment. Beneficiaries will not be limited to below poverty line families. Uh, so do not think that only BPL families will be the beneficiaries of this policy there are other families also who will be uh, beneficiary to this policy it will be extended to 40 percent of the population eligible as per 23 norms of Pradhan Mandri Janaro B Yojana it will be extended to 40 percent of the population so not only the below poverty line people but people who have rare diseases uh, and those 40 percent will be identified according to the 23 norms given in the Pradhan Madri Jan Arogya Yojana. Policy specifies increasing, increasing government support for treating patients with a rare disease from 15 to 20 lakh. As I told earlier, this, it was previously it was 15 lakhs. Now it has been increased to 20 lakhs. Policy categorizes rare diseases in three groups. So one is disorders amenable to one-time curative treatment. Disorders which are uh, which can be cured in one uh, one time. So uh, patients requiring long-term or lifelong treatment. Uh, those patients which are going to have long treatments, disease for which definitive treatment is available. And those diseases will be covered for which definitive treatment is available. So this is the Hindu news analysis for today. Thank you. My name is Rahul Pandey. You can uh, contact me on the number which has been given below for this PPT. You can also uh, contact me on the mail ID which has been given below. Uh, uh, we will join you tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning. Thank you so much for watching the One Stop Current Affairs, uh, the Hindu News Analysis. Uh, we will keep trying and keep, uh, you know, extending your knowledge for the civil, uh, for the civil services. Keep preparing, uh, keep thriving, keep working hard. This is Al Pandey signing off. Thank you so much.